Hi, I'm Savannah Jones, and this is DMG's Bootstraps and Business. And today I'm speaking with CEO, Executive Creative Director of Innovision Marketing Group, Rick Maliti, who is a cutting-edge marketer and entrepreneur who started his career as a child actor, had his first ad agency in his teens, and over the years applied his marketing skills in various industries, learning along the way what does work and, more importantly, what doesn't work for an ad agency. Now he and the teams at his anti-agency develop successful marketing strategies for both global and national brands. He explains the importance of everyone having a voice, how you just never know where that next great idea is going to be coming from, and he speaks about the exciting changes happening right now in digital marketing. It's an insightful and impactful conversation with lots of useful takeaways that can help you and your business succeed. Rick, we're finally here, finally getting to hear your story, and I'm super excited because you've led an interesting life and you followed your passion. And we'll talk more about that and and hopefully give some folks insight on how to get from here to there if they've got this dream. And we know it's a windy road to get there. But first, let's hear about you and your childhood. Well, thank you. First of all, it's a pleasure being here, Savannah. Thank you so much. Uh, Well, I was born in Sicily. uh, So I'm an immigrant. Uh, My family moved here when I was three years old. Um, We were I know, I guess on an economic level, we were not very well off. Uh, my mother and father came over with six children and uh, had one more when they were here. So um, I grew up in the San Fernando Valley in Los, An- in the Los Angeles area, which um, I guess was fortunate in many ways, uh, even though I lived on in the poor part of the neighborhood. A lot of the people I grew up around were people that were in the film industry in the 60s and 70s and 80s. So I got very interested in, in film and video when I was younger. Um, and uh, my best friend's father happened to be the vice president of business affairs at 20th Century Fox. So we had a lot of insight and got to see a lot of really cool premieres and movies. So I got very fascinated in that. So um, was a child actor, uh, was fairly busy as an actor. I did a lot of TV shows, including Happy Days and The Waltons. and. Did some, a lot of commercials and stuff like that. And I really didn't like being in front of the camera. But what I did like when I did commercials was I loved the commercial aspect of it. So I got very interested in, in advertising and commercials at a very young age. And um, in fact, when I was in high school, I was silly enough, uh, I guess crazy enough to think I could start an advertising agency while in high school. So I even had a friend of mine whose father was probably one of the most famous actors of the 60s. Uh, his father was Cesare Genova, Genova, Cesare Genova who was the opposite of Elvis Presley in Viva Las Vegas. Um, he played like the villainous, good guy, the villainous handsome man. And Cesare was a very, very uh, famous actor. But um, I got his son to invest like a hundred bucks, you know, back in the seventies, that was a lot of money in like, so I printed, we printed out stuff and um, sent out all these flyers that we had this advertising agency and we actually got some calls, but when they saw high school students walking into their offices, they were like, what is this? Who are these kids? So we never got any work out of it, but it was definitely the beginning of my advertising career. And what age was that? So that was before high school and you did go to college, right? This was during that, all that was in high school. So that was high school. And um, I started college. Um, I, I'm not ashamed to say that I was supporting my parents at the time. So as we, you know, we were as Italians, we all worked very hard. So I was working two, three jobs, including acting and so forth while in college. So while I went to, I went to CSUN for a couple of years, studied film, uh, editing and film production and so forth, but which is very, a different, very different world than what I studied now. And um, uh, then start, got into the business world. And um, as early as my early 20s, I started doing very well in the business world and in the marketing world. Um, I started at a company called Galpin Ford, which uh, I still believe is the largest Ford dealership in the United States. And uh, I got hired on to start to just kind of operate their rent-a-car. They, they hired me um, to, uh, to basically beef up their rent a car department. And, you know, I tried it their way first, which was knocking on garage, you know, garages and body shops and saying, Hey, here's a sign. Can I put a sign up to rent cars when people had need body work? And that wasn't really going very far. So I came up with an idea, uh, to start a company, uh, a division for Ford and they, for, for Galpin Ford. And they said, what's your idea? I said, I want to, um, rent cars to the studios to them because I know a lot of people in the movie business. I go, I, 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 I think they rent a lot of cars. And the owner at first thought I was crazy because we were about an hour and a half in, away from Hollywood 
in the San Fernando Valley and, and in traffic, that's even triple. And uh, he said, what you, well, how are, we, how are they going to get the cars? I said, we're going to deliver them. And at that time, there were never, there was no car delivery ever in the world. So I kind of came up, one of my first claims of fame was I came up with the first rental car delivery system. He finally agreed um, and Galpin Studio Rentals uh, took off, uh, became gigantic. And um, it, to this day, it's still one of the biggest car studio rental companies in the United States. And uh, that was something I started in my early twenties. Um, by the time I left there, I was uh, actually wooed away by the founder of Budget Rent-A-Car. And he, Maury Merkin, who was the, the founder of The Budget Rent-A-Car, uh, called me and said, hey, you know, you're stealing all our studio business. How would you like to uh, come work at Budget? I said, well, I really don't want to be in the rent-a-car business. I said, I, I like marketing and I want to open my own advertising agency. Well, he said, how are you going to do that? I said, well, I said, I'm not 100% sure yet. Now I'm about 27 at this time. And he said, well, why don't you come work for, for budget? We'll give you a budget franchise for free, for a dollar. We have to sell it to you. So we'll sell it to you for a dollar. And then you can operate it, do what you're doing for Gallup and Ford. And uh, then you can sell it. And then you can start your own advertising agency. I said, hmm, that sounds like a pretty good plan. So I did it. I thought he was going to give me a budget rent a car somewhere in the sticks, but I actually got the budget rent a car in Beverly Hills. California. Oh, okay. Convenient. <laughs> Convenient, yeah. So uh, right close to Hollywood. It was on Olympic and Beverly at the time. It's no longer there. We sold it. Um, it did really well. We, you know, we did really well. And I had a partner and we sold it. And then I did exactly that. I started my first advertising agency uh, at 30 years old and had never worked in an advertising agency in my life. Um, and just winged it. Uh, hired people, started hiring people, uh, started getting accounts. Because again, I knew people in the entertainment industry. So we started getting accounts. We got Universal City Walk was one of our first accounts, uh, Warner Chapel Records, the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences, uh, big, big brands in the entertainment industry. So uh, got that going, uh, doing very well. And then I was approached by a man named Joe Eisenman. Joe Eisenman was the, was the founder of an, a huge advertising agency that started in the 50s called Eisenman, Johns and & Laws. And Joe called, reached out to me and said, how would you like to come uh, work for Eisenman? I said, well, I have an agency. He says, well, why don't you merge your agency into Eisenman and we'll make you the executive vice president of our agency. So here I am now 34, 30, yeah, uh, 34, I guess, yeah, about 34, 35. Uh, and I said, well, what about my team? He goes, we'll hire them too. We'll hire your whole company. I said, what do I do again? He goes, you're going to be the executive vice president. I go, of the whole company? He goes, yeah. <laughs> so now, now here I am, never have worked in an advertising agency, and I'm the vice president of one of the largest advertising agencies in the country. Um, and uh, brought my whole team over, got them all jobs, really good jobs, and everyone got raises and everything, and uh, started working for Eisenman, where I got to work on some brilliant accounts. I got to work on Corona, Corona Beer, because Eisenman was the first agency, the agency that created the uh, Corona beer commercials that you see still see on TV now with the Find Your Beach. That was all created at Eisenman out of Chicago's office. Uh, got to work with Pennzoil because that was their account from the beginning. So they they created the Pennzoil brand. Global global brands like Neutrogena, General Motors, uh, Domino's, uh, giant, giant brands that I got to got the exposure on and I got to work with. So I got to learn really, really the, the importance of brand and how to operate an advertising agency and really how not to operate an advertising agency, which is why you see over here, right, yes. the, the anti-agency, <laughs> I'm doing it backwards on the screen, the anti-agency, um, I knew how not to operate an agency. So uh, Eisenman got sold um, and I went off and started another small little boutique agency. Now we're in about 2000, which was doing great, but we had like, I had like a casino client, a lot of casino clients, uh, Merv Griffin Enterprises was my client. Um, we were doing work with um, uh, a lot of pro a lot of destinations, and then 9/11 hit, and just tanked. We tanked uh, like a lot of travel industries because we had all travel clients, and we tanked and I had to shut the agency down. And um, that was that was the that was kind of one of the lower points uh, in my life where I thought, oh boy, what am I going to do now? Because you know I, I don't have this agency anymore. Um, you know, I have a pretty good background. So I, I did what everybody does when they don't know what to do. I started consulting. Uh, and uh, uh, I got a call from one of my former clients when I was at, at Eisenman. And, 
and um, they they told me, how would you like to uh, come work at a casino in San Diego? Now I was still living in Los Angeles. And I said, a casino in San Diego? What kind of casinos are in San Diego? Because I thought all the casinos had to be in Las Vegas. Oh no, there's Indian casinos. I said, really? I was really surprised. I didn't really know that was going on because this is when it was just starting. Mm -hmm. So they brought me on as the um, the vice president of marketing at a, a company in a, at a casino called Valley View Casino and Hotel here in San Diego. And uh, I did that. I worked in house and I learned the casino business and the casino marketing business uh, from the inside out, which was very valuable to my career. And uh, having worked in house, I also knew how important agencies are to uh, clients and what a client really needs from an agency. So after the uh, after Valley View kind of went from just a startup casino to a massive giant successful casino here in San Diego, I approached um, the board of directors of the casino and I said, um, I'm gonna ask you guys something. And if you say no, then it's a no and I'm just gonna keep doing what I'm doing, but I'd like to open my own advertising agency again um, here in San Diego. And I'd like you guys to be my first client and I explained to them why I thought it was a good idea financially and for a lot of reasons. And they said, all right, that's a good idea. We have two stipulations. One is you don't represent any other casinos for 200 miles of us. And, and two is we're going to be your client forever. And I oh, said, well, that, that sounds like the greatest <laughs> thing in the world. And they helped me launch InnoVision. And uh, that's the, the, where I am today. And um, they're, they're still our client. Uh, we're we're going to turn, InnoVision is going to be 10 years old uh, in uh, February. And they've been our day one kind of flagship client. So here we are at InnoVision. So let's dial it back. What do you think gave you those opportunities when people reached out to you when in the beginning, when you said you didn't have much experience, even though you had your own advertising agency and then you carried on and, and your company merged with another company and then you get another offer. What do you think it was that people saw in you and they reached out to you and then gave you really that great opportunity and that advantage to learn how to and how not to and just have incredible growth? I think that's a great question. And I don't even know that anyone's ever asked me that question before. So, uh, but if I have to really be honest with you, I think it's because I've always, uh, and I, and I thank my parents for this. Uh, you know, they're not, they're no longer with us, but I thank my parents for always making me believe in myself and always approaching everything with a very positive attitude and really doing everything, no matter what it is you do, whether you like it, love it, hate it, do it the way you do your favorite thing. So you always do everything great. And I've always been very enthusiastic and very optimistic. And so I think I've always approached conversations with people is we're going to do this and, and there's, and failure is not an option. And I think people, you know, that, that want to work with you like that. They like have working around people that are very confident and very positive and, and very um, enthusiastic. And look, I failed a lot in my life. It's not all, it wasn't all a success story. There's been a lot of failure in there, but I think the failures are the greatest thing that ever happened to me because it taught me so much about how to develop myself as a better person, uh, develop myself as a better communicator, and develop myself as a kinder person and more compassionate person. And that, that takes a lot of time because when you grow up in a, uh, in a city like Los Angeles, it, there's a lot of dog eat dog there and, and it's easy to get callous. And so I kind of had to dial that all back at some point in my career and say, I, I need to reposition myself, my brand into a, a, a better person, someone who I am internally, but isn't coming through the way I wanted to sometimes. So I worked on my, on my own brand a lot and I think that that's really made me a happier person and definitely a more successful person. It's kind of that all in mentality, whatever it is, I'm all in, you know, you want me to do help with an event and, and wipe tables. I'm all in because guess what? Next time around, maybe you're running the event or you're a co-partner in the event. So I look at that as an all in mentality and you see the signs work hard and be kind. And in the beginning of time, you're pretty focused on success and money and, and where you want to go. And then when you finally get into your groove, then you can kind of expand your horizons a little bit and take a broader look into humankind and humanity. And, and I know a lot of what you do, it's a, it's a, you've got that creative streak in you, but you're also a, if I'm, if I'm calling this correctly, a, a problem solver, you're always looking for solutions and that's taking you down a lot of interesting paths as well. 
Yeah, I think that's that's exactly right. I'm looking for solutions. And, and if you think about what marketing is, it's really finding solutions to problems. And and then and then surrounding yourself with, with brilliant people, which I have here at Intervision, uh, that know how to take that and bring it into uh, an advertising campaign or a marketing campaign. And the other, th yeah, so I, I think you're absolutely right. I think being uh, solution driven is a very, we have an expression at our agency, you know, don't, don't bring me problems, just bring me solutions, you know? So uh, that's something that we all talk about all the time. So I think that's probably something that uh, we've all grown very near and dear to, but there's other, there's so many things about brand. I think learning that at, at Eisenman Johnson Laws, uh, understanding what a brand is, and then being able to take that corporate brand concept, which is what is a great brand? When you think about a great corporate brand like Disney or Nordstrom or Apple or the tremendous brands, brands, you think about what makes them so unique and so successful. And if you take apart what they do and the way they think and the way they treat people and the way they treat their, their people that work for them and the way they treat their customers and their clients, you start to understand that if you could take that model and turn it into your own, a human aspect of your own human brain and have that same type of philosophy as a, as a human and make your brand fantastic and then make those around you fantastic, then you could develop a, a very successful organization out of that um, with a winning attitude and, and an attitude of excellence, which is something that we spend a lot of time on at InnoVision. That's really what it's about for us is, is being excellent, being different, and and proving that not just saying it but a, with a high high level of customer service you think about Nordstrom you think about Disney you think about Apple high high level of customer service um you know that that amazing attitude of getting you know whatever the problem is solve it again solve problem solve it so all of that I think is important in understanding your own human brand and what that human brand contribution is to the company that you work with and the team that you're part of um, is really critical. So what you really want to have to have a great business is you need to have all these people that have great brands as individuals that are positive, enthusiastic, uh, great communicators, approachable, kind, compassionate, um, you know, diverse. We love, we're very diverse and we have a very diverse group of people. Uh, I'm a huge proponent of diversity and equality and everyone has a voice at our company. And these are, these are the, the you know, I can't control what's going on in the world, but I can at least create an environment and individual that's safe and, and, and great communication and diverse and everybody's equal and everybody has a voice, no matter who you are, what your background is, where you come from. So we have people from all walks of life at our company. And it's really a great melting pot of uh, like-minded people. I hear that a lot uh, in regards to company culture, that it is so important and it's important to walk the walk when you talk the talk, because a lot of times you can see it in the mission statement or see it on a plaque on the wall, but when individuals are actually coming into the office, it's something completely different. So uh, when you have your brand ambassadors and your team and your members out and about and building relationships with your clients and with partners and in the community to reflect that culture. And it sounds like, um, and it's, and, and a lot of times it starts at the top and, and that's, and, and then, it, you know, from the bottom up as well, and you meet in the middle, but uh, it's one thing to say it and it's another thing to do it. A hundred percent. And, and it, it's something that has to be self-taught in many ways, because, you know, at, you know, at my age, uh, I worked in, in companies where culture was not that important. I mean, culture is a new, almost a newer concept for businesses as the world has changed, as the as things have changed. And so you have an opportunity there to either fight the change or embrace the change. So we've chosen obviously to embrace the change and, and, and evolve with the world and the way the world is evolving. And so I think that that speaks a lot to our culture and our company uh, as being so diverse and so fair and so kind and everyone has a voice. It's what people want. And you can, you, when you, when you experience it, you can understand why they want it because it's a fantastic experience when you're working with like-minded people that are visionary and that are fair and are kind and don't have any, you know, uh, mores or things that they're hung up on or, uh, um, you know, believe in equality for everyone, regardless of, of where they're from or who they are, or what gender they are or anything like that. Uh, that's a, something I'm very, very passionate about is that kind of culture. Uh, because it, it's, 
it's something that's inherent in me, but took a long time for me to find in myself. And once I found it, I realized how much I love it and, and, and I've completely embraced it. I think embracing change is so critical. When, when we started our company, we were primarily doing radio and television, uh, but then the digital age came upon us. And again, we had to determine what do we want to do? Do we want to be stuck in our ways and, and be hardheaded like some companies that, you know, Blockbuster Video is a great example. Do we want to be a Blockbuster Video or do we want to be Netflix? You know, and so we obviously chose to get into the digital space and we've done so very well by creating great partnership with, with digital partners and, and, and getting very, very well um, uh, versed and, and a great understanding of the digital world and where we're going with it. So that's now one of the largest parts of our business is, is our digital departments, our social media, our web development, our digital uh, advertising is, is the fastest growing segments in our company. So embracing change is something that we're doing constantly and something we talk about all the time. People are generally afraid of change, but you can't be afraid of change because you have to understand that, that if something is growing, it's changing. And the minute something stops growing, it stops changing. So if you, if you take what I just said and kind of encapsulate it, what you're saying is, if you want to grow, you have to change. Otherwise, there's no way you're going to grow because there's nothing in the world. And, and I've bet people this and, and uh, won some nice gentleman bets um, that you can't name something in the world that grows without changing. You just can't. And so if you, if you understand that, you all of a sudden look at change more as a, as a, as a philosophy than a fear. And you embrace it and you constantly want to change and grow. You don't change for the sake of change. You say you change to make things better, to, to, to evolve. Right. I remember uh, in the beginning of my career, I was in broadcasting and media for over 20 years. In the beginning of my career, uh, it was when radio started consolidating. And so somebody gave me the Who Moved My Cheese book. Mm, and, yeah, good book. And, and, and great little book, right? Great little book. And yeah. I read that and took it on wholeheartedly. And I think I had seven owners in seven years and made the cut every time and ended up as the program director of the radio station, which means I was the boss. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was, and really that book, as little as it is, it just inspired me to say, all right, what's next? That's different. Uh, this has changed. How do I, how do I make this work for me? And how do I make this work for the company? And how do I make this work for my staff? Next, 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 next. So, uh, and this, the podcast, you know, it's like, uh, oh, it's another change. Okay. Uh, what do you need to do? How do you make it work? How do we make this a success? How do we make it a success for you? How do we make it a success for the company? It's like, everything is constantly moving and uh, some people don't like change and some people can't wrap their arms around it and others are just like what's next yeah, yeah bring it on that's what i say about change i'm like well, <laughs> bring it on i mean uh you know and, I, and, and you know the way the human mind is wired it's very it's very interesting because we we do we are very programmatic so i always tell people if you want to start learning how to uh, uh, make change part of your life change things try changing where you put your trash can one day Try changing where you usually hang up your towel. You're gonna to find out that you keep going back to where you were going until you understand that you have to consciously understand I'm making a change and think about it all the time for it to happen. Because it's not gonna happen if you allow your instinct to do it. You have to rise above and take control of your own inner self because your inner self wants to control you. But I, what I've learned from people that are super successful is they control their own inner self. Which is, which is much greater than allowing your, your inner self to, which was emotional and, and hasty and snappy. That's when you see people make irrational decisions or, 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 or scream at someone or do something they shouldn't be doing. They're not listening to their intellectual self. They're listening to their emotional self. And if you can learn to, uh, you know, which is where the expression emotionally intelligent comes from, I think that's what one of the keys too of, of what's helped make me more successful, especially later in my life, is I've 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 become more emotionally intelligent. I've I've learned to control my emotions. I've learned to be a great listener. I've learned to uh, be compassionate, to understand people, to really really care about everyone that's in our company. Um, just as much as I care about anything. And, and in fact, we operate under an inverted pyramid um, strategy, which is I'm at the bottom of the pyramid. I don't want to be at the top of the pyramid. I want to be at the bottom. I want to support the people that need support. I want them to support the next group of people. I want everyone supporting everyone rather than 
stuff flowing from the down, the top down. I want stuff. I want stuff happening at the top of the inverted pyramid where all these people are doing things and helping clients and working and generating ideas and being supported by senior people who can offer them guidance in, um, in experience and, and situations that maybe they haven't encountered yet. So we're really just more of a support team for our, for our, uh, the top of our pyramid. I love that because I'm I'm typically an end user, you know, I'm run the equipment, do the editing and uh and I always find sometimes if it's the other way around, the person at the top doesn't really get what I'm doing here and then I end up with the wrong equipment, uh you know, things that don't work exactly right because they were saw it in a book or some engineer may have told them and it's like, no, end user, you know, the person who's actually stepping in front of the client, the person who's actually doing the work, get to know actually what they're doing and what they need. And then everybody is successful and it's for the good of all, because everybody sees the same thing and they're working towards the same goal. Absolutely. And everybody wants to be important. Everybody wants to be part of the process. Everybody wants to contribute ideas and thoughts and everyone should, everyone should in a company, everyone should have, that freedom, we don't have any boundaries. Um, you have a job, but you also have the flexibility to go in and sit. We don't have, we don't allow closed meetings at our company. Everyone can walk into any meeting at any time and sit in and listen or contribute. Um, there's no, uh, there's no boundaries in our company. There's no walls. Uh, our space is very open. Um, there's, no, you just, we just won't allow that. We won't allow someone to say, well, you shouldn't be in this media meeting because you work in accounting or you shouldn't, anyone can sit in on any meeting at any time with complete transparency. And it's, it's worked really beautifully. And a lot of people have actually started in one part of the business and now moved into other parts of the business because they, they really found where their passion is or what makes them, uh, makes them tick. So um, really, really a good philosophy that I, that I, you know, definitely endorse. Well, sure. Free flow of ideas, free flow of interest. If you're interested, check it out. You might, you know, who know, you never know where the next great idea is going to come from, really. Yeah, chances are it's not going to come from you. It's going to come from <laughs> That's for sure. Yeah, no, not me too. <laughs> no, no, I know, I, no, I know, I know. I know. You know I know. As, as yourself, it's not going to come from you. It's going to come from someone else. And it will, will make you a great leader is listening to people and, and, and listening to their ideas. Don't, work, don't live by the invented here philosophy. It's not a great philosophy at all. You want to just... Whatever idea is the best idea, that's the idea you want to hang your hat on to, regardless of where it comes from, what who it's from. Uh, you know, I don't care if the FedEx guy comes in and wants to sit down on a meeting, he has some good ideas. If he has the time, come on in and sit in on our meetings. I would love it. I'd love to hear what his ideas are, what would make something great. I love that. I, and, and I agree in that. So uh, after the pandemic, because we're getting close to the other side of it now, so I miss the hallway conversations because that's where a lot of those ideas come somebody's just walking from somebody else's office or they just got off the phone and, and then you catch a little bit of it and then you have another conversation and i feel like a lot of that uh obviously has been missing and you it just lose a lot of interpretation of the interpretation with zoom and texts and emails there's just i feel like the wheels start to spin again how do you feel about that at this point in time <laughs> Yeah, uh, well, I will say that obviously the technology got us through this, but uh, if it had to happen, I think it would have been horrendous without Zoom. Uh, but I'm not, a, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, it's not that I'm not a fan of Zoom. I'm not a fan of not being in, in personal touch with people. Right. So um, that's what I, that's what I miss the most is, is that energy that's created by a lot of people in the room that all of a sudden the light bulb goes on and everybody sees that light bulb and that energy is created and it's fantastic. You don't get that on Zoom. It's also easy for people to check out on Zoom. Uh, and you can't, it's not as easy, to, if you're in a meeting in a room, it's not as easy to check out or read your emails or check your phone or you don't do that in meetings, uh, in real life meetings. So uh, you lose a lot of that focus. You lose a lot of um, uh, really kind of just the, the, the synergies, knowing what's going on around the company. I, I sit right in the middle of the company and, and I'm able to see what's going on. And I love just going and talking to people and popping in my head and what's this meeting? What's going on here? The, you know, having these really great uh, impromptu conversations that we're, we're, we've been creating some amazing work and doing some great things for clients. In fact, our client list has grown and we have clients all over the country. So that's really kind of where I think now Zoom is gonna be very beneficial for us is we do have a lot of clients outside of California many, and I think maybe even the majority now. And this is great because we can see them, we can talk to them without having to hop on a plane and everything takes three days for one meeting. 
it's a nice meeting now. And, and I'm, I, we're still going to make those trips. We're still going to make the in-person trips because they're very important. But this is great day-to-day -day stuff. But for local clients, but for creating us as, a, as an entity, being in one building is critical. It's critical. Right. Because back to what you said, you never know when the next idea is going to come. And and it's easier to make sure things aren't falling through the cracks when you have eye contact. Oh, yeah. You can pop into somebody's uh, office opposed to waiting for an email. And, you know, everything's yeah. done over the computer. It's just there's a little bit of a time void, yes. you know, opposed to uh, the face to face and being able to, you know, call the shot and get something done pretty quickly. 100 percent. 100 percent. Well, we could talk all day about, you know, your anti-agency, um, your other businesses and all of those kinds of things. And, and I'd like to uh, maybe do another conversation at a, at a later time, but I want to kind of wrap it up. And I just want to find out because I know you've got uh, a lot going on. Uh, you're a busy guy. Uh, you've got a lot of plates in the air. Is there anything going on in your life that you're super excited about now that's new, that's on the horizon that you haven't done yet? Um... Well, I mean, I, you know, on a personal level, on a personal level, I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, my wife and I love the hike and snowshoe. And we do a lot of that stuff. And uh, I'm learning how to work with tools like um, power tools and build things, which I'm really enjoying being creative that way. Uh, on a business level, I think what's what's really exciting me right now is getting back to the office because we have uh, we've we have created some amazing work and I and we've grown and we've added people that I haven't met in person yet in our company and I'm super excited about that that is probably one of the greatest things that I'm looking forward to is getting in with this new team we have new people a uh, larger group of people and watching what we will be able to do as a group as opposed to individuals working you know, on screens like this I'm super excited about that I'm super excited about technology and where technology is going in advertising and the flexibility that it's giving us and the ability to take clients uh, investments and really, really find customers with digital, um, digital uh, philosophies and digital strategies uh, that we can go and find who exactly their customers are, really know their customers, what they like, what they don't like, and just market to them on a very, very intimate, personal level. I'm very excited about that because marketing has always been very much on a sociology level where you're kind of marketing to the masses and hoping that the pe what your message is resonating with certain people in that, in that group of people that you're talking to. But now we can go in and for one client with one campaign, we can find their customer, but then segment those customers into specific uh, creative campaigns that target and speaks to each person's hot buttons. Like if you, if you have, um, you know, take a, a chicken sandwich, for example, we have a very, very successful chicken franchise, uh, Huey Magoo's out of uh, Orlando, one of the fastest growing franchises in the country. We started working with them when they had three locations about four years ago. They are now on the books to build over 200. And I guarantee in the next two years, it'll be four or 500. Uh, and what, what's really cool about what we could do for them, we can sell chicken sandwiches before you would just say, here's a chicken sandwich, doesn't it look delicious? But now with digital, we can go in and talk to moms of why chicken sandwiches are important to their, them and why to high school students, the chicken sandwich is interesting and speak to them in all these different languages for all these different demos. One campaign, same message, same overriding strategy, but just in all these different languages that are gonna, that are gonna be hot buttons for the specific market of that product. I love that, I mean, that really excites me. Yeah, I don't think that people really realize how individualized digital marketing is now it, because it, everybody's still, not everybody, but uh, overwhelmingly, people still look at traditional broadcasting the way it was done. And it's kind of a blanket marketing campaign mm -hmm. opposed to the new era of you actually can target somebody where it used to be a you know, targeted email campaign. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. You know, yeah. But now it's for real a definite individualized target. And you can, just as you said, really get more bang for your buck and figure it out and make it work. It's so much more granular. I mean, again, before you would just sell one product and you sold it the same way to everybody. Now you have that product and you and you uh, slice up that that your market into all these different segments. And for one campaign, you might have 15 different creative campaigns underneath that 
with 15 different strategies, 15 different looks, 15 different creatives, you know, for business travelers, for not business travelers, for families that travel, for individual travelers, you know, however you want to, you, however you want to market all to who, still selling the same product, but really, really explaining to them why this product is right for them in their language. Because before it was just so broad. Yeah, I mean, it did well. And look, I'm a big proponent of, of the traditional media still, because that's really a great way to create a brand. But most, a lot of clients and customers don't have the money to do TV and radio in a big way and the right way. So you really kind of have to start from the bottom of your funnel where the transactional stuff is happening to generate money and then for your client and then let them work their way up the funnel, which is exactly what we're doing with Huey Magoo's. We started with Huey Magoo's uh, small ideas in, in, in some digital and now it's expanded and you know we have you know all these various states we're doing things in. They're gonna move into radio, they're gonna move into television. Um, and plus, you can do all that stuff on, on on digital too. I mean, even more with more, with more pinpoint targeting, obviously with OTT television. So there's a there's a, I can talk digital forever. I love it. I'm a, a huge proponent of it. Uh, I think it's a very important part of the mix. I think the mix is still important, uh, but I I would definitely uh, recommend to everybody that they uh, they look at a good digital uh, concept. Our agency has something that no other full service agency in the country offers, which is a way to be able to track people in the past. And so that's something that uh, is exclusive to Intervision through our digital partners. And we have a, a different division of our company called uh, Intervision Digital Marketing Group. And what we do is pretty unique, pretty astounding. And, and when I put it in a nutshell, when people say, well, what is it? What is it? Basically what I say is, how would you like to create a, a database of all your competitors' customers for the past year in one day. I would like that very, very much. <laughs> yeah, and that's what we can do. We can, we can find, if you, at, like we're a chicken client, we can find everybody who he's eaten in fast food restaurants and QSR restaurants in their trading area, every customer that's been in one of their competitors' locations for the last year, put it all in the one database and then start segmenting that database the way I was talking about before and start marketing to them. It's definitely one of the major reasons why Huey Magoo's has grown from three franchises to over 200 in four years uh, is pretty, it's a, it's a, a phenomenal success story. And while it, you know, we're the marketing part of it, you still have to have great product, great operations, great service. That's all got to be there. You can't just have great marketing. You got to have a great product and you've got to have great service. People are very, very in tune with service orient, oriented companies right now. And I think to succeed today, you have to really have to understand culture, great service and operate above the line. Don't just be such a bottom line thinker. Well, it's a whole new world, lots of new tools and toolbox. So for anybody who has been thinking about marketing or an advertising campaign, uh, what's that first, what's that first step? What would you suggest? Well, it depends. I mean, obviously the, the, the age of the company. I mean, if you're just starting out, you know, do yourself a favor, include a marketing budget, just like you include a, an operations budget, a, a construction budget, uh, operator, you know, payroll budgets, make sure you give yourself a nice, healthy marketing budget because the days of they will build it and they will come are over. You have to market, you have to have, promote yourself. And even if you're a single location store, there's ways to do it uh, through digital and social that, that, that are very effective. We did that, like I said, for Huey Magoo's is one example. We have dozens of examples. Um, Huey Magoo's is one. And, um, and, and make sure you allocate a budget. If you're an existing organization with a healthy budget, you, you know, the right thing to do is, is your, is your advertising uh, current? Is it really uh, utilizing all the uh, new strategies, all the new digital strategies available to you? And you could think you know what an ad is online, but really it's, there's so many uh, pieces to it. It's really important that you work with an organization that understands digital marketing the way it really is intended to be. Uh, because a lot of companies are, uh, unfortunately, are not are a little unsavory and are not really doing it right. Um, you know, I feel very confident in the way we do it. We have the results to prove it, um, and we have the we have the technology that is exclusive to us that can do something that no other no other agency can do, which is create an entire campaign using the strategy as a full service agency. Deliver this technology. Uh, the the uh, you know the ability uh, to do that is 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 here. Uh, it's available and the results are astounding, but I will always preface it by saying, no matter what, always remember, marketing is a marathon. It's not a sprint. 
all right? It's not a one day drop an ad in and you get results, it is not. Marketing is relationship building in mass, all right? And think about how long it takes you to create a great relationship with one person. It's the exact same situation in creating relationship with masses of people. You have to be, uh, you have to be consistent. You have to be with, you have to talk to them consistently. You have to be there for them all the time. You have to always have your message in front of them. So that when they're ready to talk to you, they will talk to you. You have to build trust. How long does it take to build trust in another human being? Think about that. You have to, in order to have a great brand, you must have a trusted brand. All that takes time. So the other advice, that, the other piece of advice I say is be patient for your marketing, be patient with your advertising, grab a great partner, make sure you have a great message and, and stick with it consistently for a long period of time. You should not give up or think about changing anything for at least a year, a year and a half, because it takes that long to build that relationship. So it, be ready to jump in long-term, have patience, and really find your right partner because it starts with your client's story, whether that's their company, their product, whatever it is, and then it kind of grows from there. And it, and it really is uh, a journey and it is a partnership and it takes time. 100%. 100%. <laughs> Well, Rick, I appreciated your time and I'm so glad we had this chance to talk. I really would like to uh, do this again because I know there's so much more and uh, you're so involved in so many more projects and uh, companies. And so at a later date, we'll touch base again and uh, see what's going on in your world. I would love it. Thank you for the opportunity and uh, thank you to anyone who's watched. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Bye-bye. So many great takeaways from that chat for you and your business. If you'd like to find out more about InnoVision Marketing Group, Rick Maliti, DMG, or these podcasts, just check out the show notes and be sure to subscribe. If there's something you'd like us to cover or somebody you would enjoy seeing us have a chat with, just let us know. And as always, thank you for checking out DMG's Bootstraps and Business.